That's okay. I'm messing with you. Please stop. Um, <laughs> hey, Braxton, how are you doing? Mr. Bakari, how are you? You look good. <laughs> you look great. I miss your face. <laughs> Here I am. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay, studio, we're about to go live. In three. Are we already on? Oh, we're already on. It's live. It's a hot mic. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to another installment of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting. This is uh, another important one leading us up to the point where we have had presentations on everything under consideration for this next upcoming year's legislative agenda. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, that is the list of items that we go and lobby um, both the North Carolina General Assembly to do, as well as our, our Congress, House and Senate from a national federal perspective. So this is very important. It's a lot of work that coalesce from all the work that all of our committees, our staff and our broader council um, does. And it really is that list um, that enables us to set, set the agenda of where other governmental bodies and our priorities align and where we need their, their partnership. So with that, I will ask my co-chair if he has any other tee up words and then we'll hand it over to Dana after that to go through um, a quick overview of the agenda in today's meeting and we'll get into it. And we'll do introductions after that. Braxton, uh, any uh, words from you? Yeah, just um, uh, just to kind of reiterate what Mr. Bakari said, um, we have a lot of information here. Uh, we've already covered a lot of information uh, so it's committee members, let's uh, make sure we get our questions in, but also know um, that we will, once referrals are made to full council, um, we will have an opportunity to consider everything uh, with the rest of our colleagues. So let's definitely do our due diligence, pay attention. So when we do have this vote, these votes on Monday, I believe, um, we can run through them, um, but also know that we will have, we will have other opportunities um, to consider these with, with the rest of our colleagues and at right. a later date. Thank you. So let's do introductions now. We'll start with the city attorney in the room and go around. Patrick Baker, city attorney. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Larkin Eggleston, District 1, committee member. Tark Picari, chair, co-chair. Dana Fenton, city manager's office. Donata Jackson, office of constituent services. And on the phone or Zoom, WebEx thing. Braxton Winston, co-chair and at large. Is that it on the phone, WebEx? Jeff Estes, please. Rico. 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 Renee Askew, Chief Information Officer. Pamela Neighborhood Services. Rob Broughton, Police. Okay, that seems like everyone. I'm sure we'll have other comments as we go through, but. Mr. Fenton, why don't you um, give us the flyby of what we're about to get into here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Dana Fenton of the City Manager's Office. And Donata, can you turn the slide too, please? Uh, this is, the, of course, the second of two meetings where the committee will hear legislative requests uh, from committees and from council members. Uh, the city attorney is going to kick us off today with a discussion about nuisance abatement. That was the referral made to the committee a few months ago. And he'll be followed up by Council Member Watlington, who has an issue that may be related to, uh, to uh, nuisance abatement. And of course, there's some other issues as well. She's going to be going over those. And then after that, uh, the committee will hear a request on 15 different legislative issues covering a wide variety of topics, public safety, uh, digital divide, housing, unemployment, and sustainability. And next slide, please. Uh, and some of the presentations you hear today, some of these requests that are made, uh, are not necessarily ready to go into the legislative agenda. We thought it'd be good to bring these to the uh, committee's attention, uh, just so that they have a chance to see it. And then also at the end of each block today, uh, what staff will provide is a likelihood, an assessment of the likelihood of support or opposition from the current majority leadership and in influential advocacy groups in Raleigh in the in DC. And the reason we, we put that in there is because it was a request at the last meeting that staff provide an assessment of the chances of legislation in the upcoming sessions. And then after all the uh, issues are presented, we'll do a pre-brief for the next meeting, which is on Monday, October 19th. Important meeting because that's the day that uh, 
that the committee will propose legislative agendas for the council's consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and, and I would just add, I think as we're getting to this final point of compiling uh, an understanding of all the asks, uh, the next step is very important. It's one of the most difficult parts of this committee's um, mandate each year, which is figuring out amongst a lot of really um, important and critical topics what ends up making, I'll just call a cut. And that cut doesn't mean that we don't focus and work on the other things. It means it makes it onto this piece of paper that forms the basis of our formal agenda that we go on trips and have Dana and others work on as a formal kind of adopted um, policy set of what we, what we want to get done. I, I think it's just it's important for us to remember that this analysis of what's likely to be passed or not, also things like, you know, what what is going to take someone who may have been you know, pre predisposed to help us with one item and might turn them off on, on, on another front to not achieve that? These are things that are just the reality that we're faced. So we have the tough task of looking at a whole boatload of things, all of which have merit, and deciding what is the correct combination that will create the, the greatest um, out impact and outcome that we're looking for. And we now have one more uh, committee member here that has joined us. Sir, at large, could you introduce yourself? Mr. Co-Chair James Mitchell, committee member. James Mitchell. I got to do the James Mitchell ED stuff where he announces it like a, a basketball team. I should have done that. I'm sorry. Um, so I just wanted everyone to really understand long laundry list of items we're about to go through without further ado right now. and. Our task after today is going to be saying what combines, what makes sense, what gives us the best odds for success. I hope that makes sense. And with that, why don't we jump into it? Who's first? Uh, we got Patrick Baker, city attorney. Yes, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, the item in front of you is uh, civil uh, nuisance abatement actions, and I think the request that came from the mayor was whether or not uh, there would be legislation available or should we pursue legislation uh, to effectively speed up uh, the process of uh, civil nuisance abatement actions. Uh, I have provided a primer on uh, nuisance abatement and specifically chapter 19 of the general statutes uh, to the full council, I think on a couple of occasions. And I don't know uh, if, it, if it makes sense to, to provide another primer uh, today or not, uh, because I think the issue is really limited to uh, what legislation out there uh, is available to potentially speed up uh, the process. One of the issues with uh, nuisance abatement is uh, the requirement in the statute uh, that, that certain activity, and keep in mind that, that a, uh, a nuisance action uh, is based on uh, evidence of uh, certain activity that's occurring on a particular property. Uh, that uh, that uh, activity could include prostitution, gambling, illegal possession or sale of alcoholic beverages, illegal possession or sale of controlled substances, and breaches of the peace. Uh, the statute actually speaks uh, to uh, a requirement that these activities are occurring on the property repeatedly, but there's no definition of, as to what repeatedly means. Uh, obviously, it needs to occur more than once, uh, but typically what you're looking for is a, is a long history of, of these types of, of actions here, and I have characterized uh, this particular statute as uh, essentially the nuclear weapon of law enforcement because if successful, uh, what the government essentially does is that you shut down the property, you divest the property owner of their property, and you hand them a bill for the trouble uh, it took to take their property away from them. Uh, that is something that, that is very unusual for government in terms of uh, the ability to take property and not uh, compensate you for it, uh, again, not only to not compensate you for it, but to hand you a bill for the costs associated with taking uh, the property. So oftentimes uh, when people talk about nuisance abatement, uh, the, the issue is how quickly can we do it? There's a property uh, in this particular location, let's, let's file a nuisance abatement action. Uh, and the issue really is the amount of time it takes to, to pull up uh, the information, the various uh, arrest reports or whatever police reports that, that are out there, uh, and to develop essentially the evidence necessary to, to successfully uh, go after a particular, a particular property. Uh, keep in mind that this is a winner, uh, uh, 
uh, a loser pays statute. So if you're unsuccessful uh, either in pursuing the action uh, or you lose the action after being pursued, you pay the attorney's fees on the other side, which is why uh, it's important, particularly if the city's going to bring an action, that we have all of our ducks in a row, that we have all the police reports set aside. We've got affidavits of police officers. We've got affidavits from uh, the community. And that usually takes some time uh, to develop that, that kind of evidence and to see the type of activity, repeated activity, on a particular property that will justify a finding in favor of uh, the city. So some of the time as it relates to starting and, and completing a nuisance abatement action uh, is just baked into the fact that you're looking for repeated problems at a particular location. Not to suggest that you have to, there's a finite number of of activities where we have to wait until there are five uh, or, or 10 uh, shootings on a particular property to then be able to say we can go forward. But oftentimes when you see a property, you see it over the course of years where the traditional law enforcement methods uh, simply of, of, of crime abatement uh, simply haven't worked. Uh, and then you end up in a situation where it's time to basically take this action because we're getting no assistance from the property owner, uh, and, uh, and, and essentially they're destroying the community uh, based on the, the, the activities that are, that are occurring on the property. Those are the times that, that uh, and I have personally uh, uh, prosecuted these cases uh, with my former employer. Uh, they can be very successful. They can absolutely change uh, a community literally overnight if you take away a source of, uh, of nuisance uh, and, and the main thing was to cut off the funds uh, that were going to the property owner. The one that I'm thinking of was a particular nightclub, the 14 Carat Dinner Theater. It was not the type of dinner theater that you would take a date to. Well, maybe you would. I don't know. I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, uh, comment on people's lifestyles. Uh, but the, the gist was that, that this place basically terrorized an entire neighborhood over the course of years. That was the first uh, case that I actually prosecuted, and we literally padlocked it on a Friday, and it never reopened again. In fact, it reopened into a, uh, a, a, a daycare center, and it has been a daycare center since 1999, and all of the issues related to that particular uh, outfit um, uh, ended. That, that's, a, that's a good story, but even then, it took us several months to develop uh, the evidence and to get all of our ducks in the row, because once you get started in that, uh, you don't want to find yourself, uh, from the city's perspective, uh, on the defense or that, that we're, you know, instead of doing traditional law enforcement, we're, we're using this statute uh, uh, to, to address uh, these issues. So um, I've had some conversations uh, with Chief Jennings about uh, some things that we did in, with my former employer where from the city attorney's office, uh, we worked very closely with the police department. Uh, if there were problem areas, uh, we would proactively reach out to the property owner to let them know that we were uh, reviewing their property for potential uh, nuisance abatement uh, action. Uh, and, and that oftentimes got the property owner uh, to the table uh, much sooner than later to try to address uh, and abate the nuisance on the property. And, and that's something that, that our office can commit to working uh, in any way, shape, or form with the police department to speed up uh, the, um, the abatement issue, not so much the, the, the nuisance abatement prosecution, but ultimately what you want is to abate the nuisance, uh, whether it's through a formal process or through an informal process. And, and that is something that we can do without legislation, uh, just more uh, coordination uh, between my office and, uh, and CMPD to, to make that go a little further. Uh, as to the specific request that's in front of the committee about uh, legislation, I, I honestly can't think of anything that, that I think would have a realistic chance of passing at the General Assembly in terms of speeding up this process. I think it's intentionally designed to be slow because you shouldn't be going around just taking people's property uh, and not compensating for it. And I don't see uh, on, on either side of the aisle any um, uh, interest or, or likelihood that they will want to make this a faster process going forward. Uh, but I do think that there are things internally uh, that we can do as an organization right now in terms of the coordination, uh, particularly the coordination between my office and CMPD that I think will move these along a little bit faster in terms of getting abatement, which is ultimately what we're trying to achieve. So with that, um, why don't we just hold questions until after Councilwoman Watlington has a chance to give her specific piece of this, and then I think that'll help us wrap everything together. Um, go ahead, uh, Councilwoman. Sure. So. Um 
as Dana mentioned earlier, the intent of this particular presentation and why I'm here today is to lift this up to our collective conscience, particularly because this is the Intergovernmental Committee and we've got the chair of the Safe Communities Committee here. Um, this is an intergovernmental issue. Um, it, it involves local law enforcement. It involves the ABC Commission, Mecklenburg ABC Board, ALE, uh, and city and county resources. Um, the approach uh, that I would propose is multi-pronged. Um, it has impacts to nuisance abatement, has impact to ABC permitting, uh, zoning ordinance improvements, and local business capacity building. Um, as the city attorney mentioned, that there is a place here for how do we help businesses um, improve their, their business practices and improve their um, structure so that they can help be a part of the solution as it relates to nuisance abatement. So my hope is that we buy into allocating resources to dive deeper. Um, earlier in the year, data analysts brought the first pass of data to us that showed us that 8% of violent crime occurred in five hotspots across the city. Uh, today, I'd like CMPD to share with you the second level of data analysis in regards to violent crime. Um, I found the results sobering and extremely useful. Uh, we've committed to strategic database decision making and so the intent today is to bring the data forward so that the full council can see or those uh, in attendance can see what we're dealing with and talk about potential paths forward for violent crime that may ultimately end up um, on the legislative agenda in the future, but certainly have a place here in intergovernmental committee because it's gonna take resources. So with that, um, next slide please. So Chief Estes, if you are on the line. I'm here. Okay. If you could give a quick overview of the results of the crime analysis report, and I'll just tee you up real quick. What you see here is a map of ABC sales permit or outlets with ABC sales permits. You'll see those with off-premise consumption permits on uh, the map with orange dots and the green are those outlets that have ABC permits for on-site consumption. Um, and then in the background, you see the, uh, it's been superimposed on the violent crime rate data. And that's what's indicated by the uh, blue colors on each census dot. Obviously, the more violent crime, the bluer the census tract. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Estes. <clears throat> Thank you. We, uh, myself and along with the uh, crime analysis division, uh, took a look at the questions that were posed. Uh, here regarding ABC sales permits and then the relation to violent crime and other variables uh, in relation and uh, uh, showing their correlation. So uh, if you permit me, I think I know everybody on the panel here and you all know that I'm certainly not uh, a statistician nor would I be able to explain the nuances of this. So I am smart enough though to bring with me uh, the authors of the uh, of the uh, report that we had done. His name is Mr. Robert Broughton. He's a uh, one of our uh, crime uh, analysts uh, who can give a very high level uh, overview uh, of his um, what's been long known by social scientists, which is just that there is a correlation between alcohol sales and violent crime and others, particularly when you combine. Uh, factors together to show positive correlation. So Rob, can you uh, kind of very briefly walk us through what you found and, and how you did it? Um, yes, hello everyone. Um, we were asked to do three things. We were asked to show if, if within the city of Charlotte, within CMPD's data, the relationship between ABC permitted locations and violent crime or calls for service if that relationship held, depending on it being an on-premise or an off-premise location, and then if that relationship held um, when controlling for other certain neighborhood factors. Um, and so to do that, we downloaded um, a list of all the ABC permits um, associated to Mecklenburg County from the um, state ABC site, um, geocoded that information to give it a spatial reference. Um, and coded all the permits, approximately 8,000 of them, I think. Don't quote me on that, it's between six and eight, I can't remember. Um, and many locations actually have multiple permits um, of different types, both on and off. So it's not actually as simple as just an on or off premise, unfortunately. Um, the way we coded was if a location had an, an on-premise permit of some sort, then it was an on-premise location. 
Um, and so even if they had both on and off, if they had an on, they were on premise. Um, in doing that, we showed um, that there was a correlation, which as Chief Estes has said, um, lots of research has already shown that there is a pretty strong correlation between um, alcohol permit locations and violent crime and culture service. Um, the uh, correlation between when you include all ABC permit locations was around, I think, 0.85 to calls for service um, and 0.72 to violent crime. And it's a positive correlation, meaning as the um, number of permit locations per 1,000 residents um, increased, the violent crime rate per 1,000 residents increased, and the number of citizen initiated calls for service increased. Um, for the call for service data, we used our own. Um, databases and along with the violent crime. Um, for the neighborhood um, information, uh, I gathered that from the neighborhood statistical profile areas and the quality of life study. Um, and those were my units of analysis as you see in the map. Um, those are the NPAs. Robert, can you talk a little bit about the, the factors that you looked at considering household income, education? and how that related to violent crime. One of the things that I thought was most interesting about the report was that those those other factors had a much smaller impact than one would think in regards to violent crime. You, you broke up there a little bit. I think you were, you were asking if I could talk about the relationship between um, income and, and crime. Correct. Part, correct? Of the, correct. part of the okay. report out <laughs> talked about the Hold relative on, impact of- Hold on, Ms. Wallington. Robert, I think you've got another device on. Another device. So if you've got a cell so phone or an cell iPad phone. going, turn that volume off and the echo will stop. Perfect. Robert, I was asking if you could talk a little bit about the other factors that you compared. I know that we've had an approach to violent crime or reduction looking across each committee and what each committee could do. Um, and I was very interested in the results regarding some of the other socioeconomic factors related to violent crime versus the ABC outlets. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, The, um, for comparison, the um, correlation, when I looked at the correlation between violent crime and employment rate was one of the examples I wanted to give for just straight correlation. Um, that correlation coefficient was negative 0.3, meaning as, um, as the employment rate increased, crime tended to fall. And of course, all these things are tends to, it's not a guarantee, none of this is a guarantee. Um, that relationship is a is a low moderate sort of strength of relationship at 0.3 for a regular correlation, um, whereas relationship between the ABC permit location rate and violent crime rate was 0.72, substantially stronger, um, and for culture service it was 0.5. When when you include to sort of look at a multivariate analysis, we included um, household income, employment rate, high school diploma. Um, so um, percentage of population with, a high, with at least a high school diploma, um, along with proportion of on-premises, on-premise locations per 1,000 residents and non-on-premise locations per 1,000 residents. And all of them are statistically significant, like they all matter. They all have an impact um, on, on a model for predicting violent crime and calls for service. When you only look at the proportion of on-premise and off-premise locations, the model accounts for, and I'm trying to find it, um, I think it was, yeah. The model accounts for about 76% of the variation in calls for service and 61% of the variation in violent crime. When you include all the variables, that I just mentioned, household income, employment, and um, high school graduation um, diploma um, rate. The uh, model for predicting crime goes up to 75%, so an additional 15%. Um, and the uh, rate for predicting calls for service, which is sort of a stand-in measure for disorder at this point, um, 
goes up to 80.3. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Mr. Thank Chair, you, Robert. With that, that concludes that, the that concludes. presentation. Happy to take questions. So um, why don't we start, uh, Council Member Mitchell? Yes. Th thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, both uh, Council Member Carr and Council Member Wentz. Uh, committee, I, I do want to bring up an, another one, and if you all allow me, uh, to kind of talk through it and ask if the city attorney can bring something back for us to, to look at. It's, it's along uh, corridors of opportunity. And so I, I think we have the authority to use um, condemnation for public purpose. I would like for us to look at uh, having that same ability for our corridors of opportunity and so our corridors can really uh, turn the corner and do something special. Uh, the 24.5 million, I think Councilman Wallington and Councilman McGraham can definitely can attest, some of it would not, would not be able to fulfill their potential because we have some boarded up buildings that has been there for years. So if we can direct the city attorney just to come back to us uh, to give us some language and for us to consider it, not saying we're moving forward, I'd rather us do our homework first and city attorney, if Mr. Co-Chair, is that okay? We have the city turn to bring back for corridors of opportunity only the ability um, uh, to condemn boarded up buildings just for our six corridors of opportunity. I want to be very direct and not throughout the whole city of Charlotte, but those corridors of opportunity where we are investing $25 million. Mr. Attorney, does, uh, do you have any comment or feedback on that? Is that a, a plausible ask? Yes, it is. And uh, we'll take a look at uh, our, our current condemnation authority uh, and then see if there's something else that we could uh, ask, uh, just keeping it in line with what's going on here uh, with this particular committee. If we need uh, legislation, I'll bring uh, suggestions in that regard as well. Yeah, I mean, in, unless anyone else has a concern about that, I think that's within the scope of what this committee is designed to do and, and, and get diligence takeaways for things like that. So I, I, I'm hearing no other concerns on that, I think, yeah. Uh, any, any broader questions to what we've heard? I have one, but I want to make sure anyone else who has a question Mr. Um, Chair, an opportunity. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I did forget to mention this. So just to be real clear, the, the intent today is to walk away here with a sense of buy-in to go to the next level of data analysis. Some of the things that we need to understand is um, the type of business. What is, are there other factors that in particular distinguish uh, businesses versus their relation to violent crime? Because what we'd like to understand is what are the best approaches that we can take? Are there, but we know that ABC Spirit stores that are managed through uh, Mecklenburg County see a much lower violent crime rate. And we believe that that is due to their business practices. They've got their own uh, ABC um, law enforcement officers that work in conjunction with our CMPD ABC officers. We know that their hours of operation are different. We know that they do some other things in terms of service surveillance and guardianship. And so we'd like to understand the data at another level to be able to start to distinguish what are some of the things that we can do to benchmark from places that are not seeing um, increase in violent crime versus places that, uh, that we'd like to intervene. Let, let me ask a follow-up question just to make sure I'm clear on everything I've heard. Love the use of data. Obviously, this is right up my alley, and I appreciate that. I think I heard both from the attorney and you that this was part of a broader journey we were gonna go on. And while one day it could have an item that we could tease out to be on the legislative agenda, it seems unlikely given the time frame and where we are that we're gonna have that right now in the next week or two. Yes, so that's correct. With that being the case, I, I think that while I'm a wholehearted supporter of it, I think that's probably not something within, within the mandate of, of that, that we can just say yes. I think it's mm -hmm. probably got to be something with public safety committee absolutely. and the broader stuff. So I, I don't think we can say absolutely and kind of ordain that from, from this committee, but I think that um, makes a lot of sense and I support it. The only kind of side thing I just mentioned, now we haven't gotten this deep into kind of this type of predictive an analytics to date and I, I'm very excited about it, but it's actually so far beyond where we've been. The thing that jumps to my mind is the old the old adages of you know correlation does not necessarily Equal imply causation. causation. Correct. And just for the the you know for people stupid like me, I pulled up a good graph um, that articulates that beautifully. 
um, from 1999 to 2009, um, there is a direct correlation from people drowning in swimming pools and the number of Nicolas Cage films each year that mm -hmm. come out. So while obviously that is a direct correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean one caused the other. And I think we have to be very careful that there aren't other underlying factors that actually provided the causation for both of those things to, to exist. And Understood. we end up get kind of going after one thing. So it's just one point of, of, of kind of warning as we move forward that, as you well know, data can be both powerful and dangerous if interpreted incorrectly. And, Absolutely, and, and that's, exactly, that's exactly why we're here today is to say, look, it's gonna take another level of data analysis to parse those kinds of things out, and that, but it's also gonna take a significant amount of resources. So we wanna make sure that that is something that generally that the rest of the council can support. Yep. Yes. So barring anything else, it sounds like the takeaway from this agenda item here is We've got a, an approach and a map that uh, on data analytics and, and correlation where it will continue on, but not necessarily from this committee until it circles back to something ready. And then the city attorney at the request of uh, council member Mitchell has a, uh, has a takeaway to analyze a little deeper the uh, quarters of opportunity and the wording uh, from nuisance abatement there. Anybody else on that one or? Okay, I think we can move forward. So that brings us to public safety now. And Dana, I think you're going to tee it up or something? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to tee this up real quick. Can you turn to slide seven, please? Uh, there are three state legislative requests uh, uh, related to public safety to be, be presented today. Uh, first, expand the role of the Civil Service Board to handle appeals, eliminate cash bail in the CMPD crisis intervention team. And uh, just to, as a note, uh, the committee did receive a briefing on subpoena power for the civil civil uh, the citizens review board at your meeting in September. So, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't know whether Mr. Eggleston would like to go ahead and present uh, these the first two on the civil service board, or whether Mr. Rios uh, should be. Doing I think that. Mr. Rios is going to talk with us about those. Uh, yes, I can I can speak to it if we move on to the next slide. So all three, all two, the first two items came out of the work from the Safe Community Committee's uh, community input group and the desire, um, a desire that was presented by one of the subgroups within that group was to have the Civil Service Board begin to handle appeals um, that arose out of the Citizens Review Board. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, Chief Jennings, who was deeply involved in this work, uh, with the Safe Communities Committee uh, questioned this and, and had some reservations around it. He wanted to ensure that his officers had due process and that that was not hindered um, through this consideration. And um, again, we got to be mindful of that just as much as we're mindful for the reasoning um, to bring this up in the first place. Um, we had, so it had gotten the support of the committee of the work group and then um, gotten moved forward to the Safe Communities Committee. And we were um, informed that the city attorney was undertaking the legal review uh, to see what, if all, was possible in this regard. Uh, with the next item, we can move on to the next slide, yep. Uh, this came up in our last, in, in our second to last community input group report out. Um, and this relates back to cash bail. There was a recognition that Mecklenburg County has done some work on this already, but uh, it continues to be a hindrance for individuals. Um, and of course, you know, this, this has been opposed by the bail bonds industry that um, makes their money off of the bail process. Um, in, in addition to that, Council Member Bukhari, the co-chair of this committee, um, shared that there was work occurring on the state level and shared out with the, um, with the work group that had um, offered up this recommendation that that work was ongoing. And so we know that there is movement on the state uh, level to have these discussions and to consider where this item could go. Um, the next step was really to look at CJAG as the place to bring this item to. So those two items again came out of the community input group. Um, if there's any questions, I can, I can answer those. Any questions? 
Okay, since we've covered that a little bit in the past, I think this was just kind of another touch base of it, and that will be one that we'll obviously circle back on as we consolidate um, views of what the final um, agenda could look like. Great. Uh, so, Dana, you are tasked with um, being Council Member Newton for the next 10 minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we just have a couple more things on the public. I see. I've skipped a few things. Yes. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, thank you. On the uh, next slide, please. Uh, another request came in from Mr. Uh, Winston on the crisis response team, and this has been a subject that's been talked a lot about in the Safe Communities Committee over the last few months. And, uh, and Mr. Winston, you can break it any time you want to, but I, I'd be glad to go over these points uh, uh, for you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you go over the points, just give you a little broader context. Um, uh, my, my initial request uh, started this summer. Um, it was a little broader. Um, it was in anticipation of the work that we are, 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 are doing in the Safe uh, Communities um, co Committee a as it relates to having uh, a, a different type of 911 response network, um, Billy, here in Mecklenburg County. Um, it, this, this request was in anticipation um, of, of honestly trying to work with um, the state if, if need be. Uh, the idea is that it, as we continue to approach um, uh, uh, our 911 response, not just from a police standpoint, from, but from a community health standpoint, it's obvious uh, that that um, there's an intergovernmental um, aspect of that uh, with the county that has that 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 houses those health um, um, and mental services. Um, but just also just thinking about you know what understanding the relationship Charlotte has with the state uh, if there's any opportunity uh, for preemption to come down the line you know being that we have buy-in from CMPD the um, the, uh, the county um, the community at large um, there's a lot of potential uh, changes that are that are going to be happening uh, we don't want um, uh, um, any kind of um, roadblocks to come down in, in the future uh, based on uh, interpretations uh, of, of law and responsibility from Raleigh. So um, as we kind of continue to discuss this, we kind of whittle it down uh, to, to the points that Dana can um, uh, take over on. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Uh, the request is to... Uh, is to request funding to double the number of, number of contracted clinicians to respond to high-risk mental health calls. And just a note about the co-responder concept that, uh, that CMB, CMPD employs. This is actually pretty widely supported. The Governor's Task Force on Racial Equity and Criminal Justice will be endorsing that in action pretty soon. It also seems to have support from the North Carolina Police Benevolent Association, for those of you who are not familiar with them. They they, rep, they are a, a, an association for police officers throughout the country, uh, and this is also again, as Mr. Winston said, this issue is being talked about in a in a couple other statewide uh, uh, groups right now. Uh, the uh, the concern as we look at uh, in in the 2021 session is the budget outlook for the state. Uh, they just uh, had to cut two and a half billion dollars from their general fund budget. Uh, for this last fiscal year, and uh, the, so the outlook for the next fiscal year is sort of fluid right now. Uh, we're not sure, and no one's really sure just uh, what the revenue picture is going to look like uh, as, uh, as we enter into the second year of the pandemic. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I am, I'm finished with that part. Any questions or comments? Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. And just to finish up on the public safety items, uh, previous slide, please. Uh, I was asked at the last meeting uh, for staff to provide an assessment of each of the issues as in terms of whether it's likelihood for success. And on the, uh, on all the public safety items today, we really have a mix of, 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 of assessments here. The first one, the expanded role of the Civil Service Board. As we look at that issue right now, we know that's an emerging issue, but as we see it right now is that the influential organizations and the leadership would probably be opposed to this concept. Uh, again, the, 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 anything that would uh, potentially impact the due process rights of law enforcement officers would definitely be a concern. And also, uh, we're also working right now on the, uh, or the council has had in their legislative agenda the last few sessions, the um, subpoena power for the civil uh, for the citizens review board, and we think that might have some impact on this as well. 
uh, the elimination of cash bail uh, out there from the influential groups. You have a mix of support and opposition. Uh, definitely the district attorneys, a lot of them are on the side of elimination. On the other side, you have the bail bonds industry. And right now, the bail bonds industry seems to have the upper hand. And because, the, as we see it, the leadership uh, is probably going to be opposed to that as well. And then getting down to the crisis intervention team, as I said before, this is generally supported uh, around the state by key groups and leadership. And, but again, we might have some state budgetary issues uh, facing us next year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that was good and helpful to understand as we try to frame the broader picture we're working on. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Co-Chair, I, I really like this uh, kind of chart that Dana put together for us. But Dana, I want to know, would you be open to a little modification? Because I think what's, it, what's important for us is, to me, the categories, the key influencers could be our Mecklenburg delegation, and then the leadership could be the state of the Senate. It, it, and I think that helps us as we, f we get prepared for our meeting with our delegation in January. Uh, just to see where they stand and what initiative will support. So I like key influencers and leadership, but to m just me, my personal co-chair committee, we need the big thing for us is our delegation. We can get all, how many delegation members we have? Six, 16? 17. 17. And so we, if we have a feeling where they are in some of the initiatives, as long as the state and the house, I think that could help us. J just a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the extent that I can get that, I'll, I'll try to, but Right now, it's difficult because they're out of session. They're, well, not just that, but we got that election coming up in about three weeks. <laughs> so, it's uh, they're oh, all they're yeah. all very very difficult to get a hold yeah. of right now. So. So, so, with that said, Dana, it, it, if this needs to be a December and January time frame, I think that'd be okay. fine. Good point. Thanks. So, uh, I want to I want to just insert sir here real quick, and, and Mr. Co-Chair, if, if you need to add or please uh, move around the edges. Um, Please do after. I, I, I think to Mr. Mitchell and uh, Mr. Fenton's um, conversation just illustrated was is something that me and Mr. Picard are really trying to focus on of how do we not just utilize legislative agenda, uh, but have an intergovernmental strategy, right? And so maybe, as Mr. Mitchell said, you know, a lot of this potentially we need to focus on our local de delegation to build support and find ways to get them to build support throughout the state. So I, I, I think. Um, uh, you know, as we build this strategy, some of this work has to be on us as electeds. How do we engage our other colleagues in, in other uh, in other houses um, um, to build this support? Because this is important to us, our constituents, um, and, and and our staff. So um, maybe this is a section where we need to like really figure out amongst ourselves on the committee how do we go forward in an effective way, carrying on that conversation with, like you said, our local delegations. Yes, and it, it may not hurt, given the timing and everything, to Councilman Mitchell's point, um, just to have a quick conversation with uh, Kelly Alexander, right? I think Kelly is pretty good at giving a, a temperature check, even if we can't pull and kind of engage everyone in the delegation, as to where their heads would be. At least that would prepare us um, in knowing where to focus. Great. Anybody else? Okay. Let's move along then. I think that brings us to five, right? That's correct. Council Member Newton. Uh, Mr. Newton can't be here today, so he's asked me to present uh, the issues that he has brought up. And next slide, please. The first one he has brought up is called Unemployment Able to Work. This is a request that was brought to his attention by a, a company called Avocations. It's a Charlotte company that is a certified small business firm. It's 100% woman and disability owned. And the firm works with individuals with disabilities and chronic med medical conditions to secure employment. And earlier this year, they started a legislative initiative because one of their clients was denied unemployment because he was considered to not be, quote, able to work, end quote. And you can read out, find out more about this case on tmanslaw.com. And next slide, please. And at the top is able to work, it's underlined, and that is the definition of able to work. That is in the state unemployment laws. And this is one of the things that people who are unemployed need to meet in order to qualify for, un for unemployment payments. And the issue that's been brought up is that uh, some individuals with disabilities 
receive other forms of assistance while they're working so that they may live independently. But in this case, it also may cause them to, to, to be declared not able to work, and therefore they would be ineligible for unemployment here in North Carolina. Now, Avocations is working with uh, a statewide advocacy group called Autism Speaks, and I know that their lobbyist is working on this issue because I spoke to him personally. I brought this to his attention. And, uh, and so going forward, it's, uh, I'm sure that uh, the, the, the statewide advocacy organization here um, is, uh, is, is well prepared to take this issue. Next issue, next page, please. Uh, Mr. Newton also wanted to bring up the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This is a federal bill that was filed in the Congress and it's been referred to him uh, by a group of people who support it for possible city support. And this legislation is very highly supportive of many of the goals in the city's strategic energy action plan. As you know, this is the plan where we're going to try to reduce our carbon footprint by the year 2050. Very important plan. There's a lot of different uh, uh, policy goals or, and a lot of actions being taken to try to get to that, to get to that state. Where the, where the bill differs from the, from the Strategic Energy Action Plan, it's not a difference in terms of being in conflict, but it's something that goes beyond our plan, is that the bill calls for a carbon fee on f fossil fuels that is intended to encourage energy companies, industries, and consumers to use sustainable forms of energy. And the bill would have these revenues distributed to the American people. Uh, and, and I've seen an economic impact analysis that was done by Columbia University, and, and it would show that, uh, that, the, that there would be uh, reductions in, in fossil fuel use so that, so that the country and actually the city, too, could meet its uh, CAP goals. However, the carbon fee, again, is not part of the city's strategic energy action plan. And th so the question before council, if you chose to uh, propose this to council, is whether the council would want to uh, support a carbon fee. In some cases, this is also referred to as a carbon tax. I'm not sure what the difference is in, in this case between a tax and a fee, but it, it certainly has its share of detractors and supporters out there. Yes, okay, we probably need to analyze this as it relates to, you know, where does this fall in the broader kind of specific city critical path and mandate versus, you know, this is something that some council members may want to lend their voice to, but it's really in the scope of the elected officials that we send up there, both locally and across the country. So I, I don't want... I would love for us to not be in a position to judge this one way or another from this committee, rather just think, you know, what, what does this, what does our endorsement of this into a legislative agenda both cause in, as an outcome for that, and what are the unintended consequences for the other more specific things, and perhaps that will be our takeaway. Thank you. In the next slide, uh, I'll give you a, a little brief on the, uh, on the assessments uh, on the unemployment able to work. Uh, we, we view it that there would be a, a mix of support and opposition to this issue. And the opposition really comes from, uh, uh, from basically there's a lot of concern out there among some about the, rate, about the rates that are charged for unemployment and the impact that it has on businesses. And, and also there is a, a, another concern that a, a bill like this would potentially open up the unemployment statutes to further changes to more, um, uh, to, to not just a technical fix like this, but to more substantive changes. Uh, there have been, there has been discussion throughout the state about unemployment issues and where North Carolina stands in relation to other states. The Energy, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, again, that has a mix of support and opposition. And um, in the bills that were filed, uh, or the, the one bill that was filed this year, I think there were like 86 co-sponsors of the legislation. There was only one Republican among, among those co-sponsors. And I think you'd probably see the same thing with the current leadership. There would be a mix of support and opposition to it. And as far as I know right now, this bill has not moved at all this year. 
and probably won't because of uh, what we have with the election coming up. I do appreciate uh, the way you're having a, a kind of a high level analysis on each one of the items like this. I think we should continue and evolve that in the future. It's very good. Other questions from the committee or others? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next issue, uh, Mr. Chairman, is the digital divide, and these were a couple of issues that were brought forward by Mr. Winston. And thank you very much, Donata. Uh, again, uh, we have uh, a couple different requests here, and, they're, and this is, of course, digital divide is both a state and federal issue. And uh, Mr. Winston, would you like to step in now and kind of give the big picture as you see it, or would you like me to continue uh, with these points? I think he wants me to continue with these points. Yeah, go ahead. So anyways, uh, at the federal level, what, what, we see, what we're seeing happening is that the Congressional House Democrats proposed a broadband initiative in their infrastructure package that was released earlier this year. That was called the Moving Forward Act. Uh, and in that bill, they had $100 billion set aside to promote broadband in rural, suburban, and urban areas. And they had some other, other things in there about uh, for remote learning and for digital, digital skills. And those are two very important issues uh, for us, and especially around the country, with remote learning for children who are learning from home because of the pandemic and because we do have a, a lot of people who don't have the digital skills. So uh, we have prepared a uh, possible support position uh, to include in the federal legislative agenda. I'll just read it real quick. Support increased federal resources to promote competition for broadband internet infrastructure to unserved and underserved rural, suburban, and urban communities, prioritizing communities in persistent poverty. And I think here in Mecklenburg County, uh, that is something we see in, in, the, in the digital divide right here in this county is that there are a lot of people, uh, they may not have the infrastructure in, and they also may need help with things like paying for their internet subscriptions. Next slide, please. Uh, turning to the state, uh, the General Assembly in the past year has appropriated quite a bit of funds for telecommunication companies to construct broadband infrastructure in the rural parts of Tier 1 and Tier 2 counties for for those who don't know about Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 counties, that is the scale that the state uses uh, to assess uh, uh, the relative wealth of counties. Uh, a county like Mecklenburg, one of the highest uh, wealth counties in the state, we are a Tier 3 county. And, but our, we, again, as I mentioned before, we have different needs than, uh, than a lot of other counties throughout the state that need the actual infrastructure. Uh, we have needs here with the affordability of internet subscriptions. Of course, the schools have done quite a bit of work in this area along with the city and some not-for-profit partners uh, in trying to get hotspots uh, distributed to school children. And that's a, that's a partnership that you all have taken part in. Uh, and there's a, there's a possibility there that, that something could be talked about with the General Assembly. You might have a program perhaps where, a proposal perhaps where it would be, say, low-income house, households. Uh, folks living in the federally designated opportunity zones or what we call the corridors of opportunity. Of course, this idea needs to be tested with uh, stakeholders and leadership, but uh, we, we, we see some, some possibilities here uh, going forward. Of course, um, the same issue with this is uh, with, the, with the other budgetary issue applies to this issue as well. The state is... Uh, the state budget situation is fluid at this point. We don't know just uh, how much, if any, they'll have to cut because of the pandemic and how the pandemic is uh, impacting their revenues. We should get a, a clearer picture on the state budget outlook uh, committee in the next uh, few months. Uh, there is an important tax deadline tomorrow uh, for some taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably at that point, um, the estimators at the state. There is a consensus revenue forecast group composed of representatives from both the administration and the, uh, and the staff at the General Assembly uh, to uh, look at the state general fund. So we should have some clarity here in the next month, month and a half uh, 
But uh, at this point, right now, all, what we can say is that the state budget outlook is fluid for next year. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, on, on, on the digital divide, uh, we, we do see support at the federal level for some action uh, from uh, both the key influencers and the leadership. Uh, at the state level, uh, again, that needs to be tested. But, however, again, the state has put a, quite a bit of money into broadband infrastructure over the past year and, of course, the, the state budget issues as well. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I think, that, as we've discussed, um, there definitely needs to be some more diligence uh, that's underway, uh, completed on this one, so we have the full picture. We have local initiatives um, that have been mentioned from CMS to big picture vision items like how do we make internet a public utility uh, in Charlotte. Um, we've got the rural urban connection that we've made connections in the digital divide um, through things like Interstate 74, and we just need to better understand. Uh, I think this is one of those ones where we have several items that always make the legislative agenda that are kind of aspirational statements in nature, support this kind of thing, right, leaving it open. I think this is a case where enough work is being done on all levels that um, maybe not in the high-level top wording, but in the um, supporting documentation, we can figure out how, how to get a little specific with some asks. Um, but obviously, that's going to take some offline communication with different members in leadership and in, in all the bodies we're talking to to see what that might be so we set it up for success but good work so far and let's just keep moving on it okay. thank you okay <clears throat> which leads us to housing thank you mr chairman uh next slide oh we're, we're already there thank you very much <laughs> uh folks we're in the home stretch of today's meeting uh this is the last block of issues to be uh, presented we have eight legislative requests related to affordable housing, and it does relate to your, uh, your housing framework and your, develop, your neighborhood development strategic priorities. Uh, there was a request from Council Member Johnson on mandatory inclusionary zoning. That's a state issue. And then there's also seven requests from the Great Neighborhoods Committee. And I, I must note for the record, a committee is that Technically, these, these requests are in front of the city council, so we wanted to bring them to you today just so you would see them and, and have the, and also uh, from the um, request from last month to provide a sort of a, 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 an assessment of the chances of these succeeding in the next General Assembly. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, sir, sorry. Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, can we go back on one, one slide, please? I thought the source of income discrimination, when we talked about a council meeting, that was still in the Great Neighborhoods Committee. Mm -hmm. Yes, all, all seven of the requests from Great Neighborhoods, uh, I understand, are still before the city council. And, uh, and so uh, we thought that bringing them today just to, just to uh, let the committee know uh, about these. Mr. Fenton, does Mr. Eggleston have an update on that? I, I think what I had been told was that the, and Ms. Weidman can confirm this, that these recommendations were moved forward to the council, but not necessarily um, with a vote or recommendation in favor or against from the Great Neighborhoods Committee. So I think they okay. kicked the can to the full body without taking a vote. So if that some, seems somewhat correct, then I think that falls within the parameters of what our mandate is here, which is gather up anything that could be considered viable or important for the legislative agenda from staff, from council members, from committees, and from the community, and put it all together as we are emerging towards uh, okay. that, that milestone, okay. and then see what makes sense for us to vote out of this committee to the broader council. So that's probably just process-wise where we are with this, then, I'd assume. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, just, just for clarification. And, thank you. And, and maybe, maybe I can add some to it, because this uh, source of income uh, discrimination was something that had an intergovernmental approach, um, but also there was, you know, the, the, we have our own local ordinance. Um, so what's in a great neighborhood 
my understanding was the consideration of how do we deal with um, our local ordinance. Um, but the, the, the rub is that our local, any change to our local ordinance really does where to have teeth needs to have uh, 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 some, um, some type of legislation attached uh, to really give us uh, the, the type of effect that we want. So um, I think it's a kind of a parallel process that we're, that we're considering, I guess. This is Malcolm. Uh, it has to be voted on our committee and then forwarded to the council. Uh, and then the council will make a referral to the Intergovernmental Relations Committee for consideration. Is that right? No, I mean, uh, what we discussed before was that certainly is a path that committees can take for committee to committee referrals. But we don't, don't have that, do we? I think the, the other path is a standing kind of referral that each year is with the intergovernmental relations is to collect things from those bodies and push it forward. I, I don't have a preconceived notion of which one of those is better, to be honest. Whatever the, the will of the broader body or this body is, um, I think we can support either one. But I think tactically, um, we, we gather things from staff and from other committees as kind of the mandate of this committee's annual work of compiling something to then vote forth pieces of or all to the broader council for adoption. So one way or another, it makes it to the council. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know if my co-chair feels differently. I don't have a strong feeling either way if, if you do as to which route that should take. I'm, I'm, I'm tracking with you right there on that. So, uh, Malcolm, is there a specific route that you'd like to propose for this one, since this is indeed your, your committee's um, topic? Well, I, I think all all of those should be voted out of the, the Affordable Housing Great Neighborhoods Committee and forwarded to the council. And that, that's where the work is being done in terms of uh, analyzing the, the, the policy versus just saying that it should be on our legislative agenda. So there's folks on, I mean, work to be done. In terms yeah, of agreed on that work to be done policy point. I mean, just specifically, will it, the path by which we come to a conclusion of, will it be formally on this cycle's uh, legislative agenda, or will it be in a parking lot or in a, maybe a new topic of items to start conversations, but circumstances aren't, aren't proper for us to ask for that outcome. So uh, I don't mean by any means the broader work. I just mean, does it physically show up on the piece of paper or not? That's fine, I guess. I, th I think we're all saying the same thing right, right here, right now. So I, I think we agree with you, Mel. Okay. And Mr. Eggleston? Mr. Graham, just so in case I got something wrong there, did I misunderstand? I thought that these were no longer in the Great Neighborhoods Committee, but that the Great Neighborhoods Committee had decided to move them forward to the full council. Did I miss some details on that? Well, certainly the source of income discrimination hadn't been, hadn't been moved to the full council at all. And the other stuff, and Ms. Wyden is on the phone, help me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure. Have we made a referral to the full council on these items yet? We, we heard these at your September 16th, I believe it was, um, Great Neighborhoods Committee. Uh, we discussed, we also talked about source of income, I think at your October 5th strategy um, session. And so on September 16th, um, I believe we said that we would um, move these to this body for just um, information collection, and then ultimately the full council would decide what is going to be on your legislative agenda. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I I, um, I think that's something we could probably pretty easily uh, post this this committee meeting, circle up on. Since there is no action today, we're just we're just learning. We'll circle up and make sure everyone feels like we have the optimal. Um, um, positioning for for making making a decision. Um, are there any other comments on that one? I know there's a number of others, right? Yes, Mr. Mitchell. And, and Mr. Coach, just a point of information, if, if staff can share with us, uh, Councilmember Johnson request about mandatory inclusionary zoning. Uh, I, I think that has been a top uh, 
topic for, I know, at least eight years. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we can just get some history about uh, how many times we have pursued that and um, our, our uh, lack of, of victory, I, I think it would be helpful to the chair's co-chair's point so everybody will have the data. So, Dana, I don't know if you want to speak to it, just provide an update report to all of us. Yeah, I would be glad to go ahead and, and update the committee right now on that. And, and if Donata, you turn to the next slide on, on inclusionary zoning. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, it, it, just, just overall, uh, and I don't know whether Councilmember Johnson's on the phone or not, but I, I'll go ahead and start this. As, as everyone knows, we got an affordable housing uh, shortage here in the city and in our area in general. And inclusionary zoning has been used in other areas to try to attack those areas uh, or, to, or, to, um, or to address those areas of affordable housing shortages. And basically what it is is that it's a tool that requires the inclusion of a, of a prescribed level of affordable housing in a development project, and it would be specified in a zoning ordinance. As you all may know right now, um, or you may not think of it this way, our city zoning ordinance does have a voluntary provision currently that incentivizes affordable housing through a density bonus, for that, such as uh, more units per acre, et cetera. But we're talking about a mandatory program here it, it, as opposed to the voluntary program. And, uh, and as you all may recall, um, and I think, Mr. Mitchell, you were on the council in 2016, the city attorney sent out a memo talking about mandatory inclusionary zoning that said that it would require enabling authority from the state. There isn't a law at the state that says cities shall not do mandatory inclusionary zoning. There's even not a law that says you may do it, but it's an interpretation of what the current laws are. And that was, that was the result. Uh, and that me memo from 2016 was based upon an earlier one from before 2010. Uh, I say before 2010 because that's the year I started with the city. So, and in answer to your, your question, uh, Mr. Mitchell, is that um, the short answer, we have not asked or requested uh, this type of authority. We were basically, the, we have known that the General Assembly, uh, in, in with the current leadership, is, is very much opposed to mandatory inclusionary zoning. They believe that the voluntary ways of doing it uh, should be pursued. They don't want to put a mandate onto the shelter industry. And even the shelter industry, the, the major associations are opposed to this uh, for the most part. And they're the ones who hold the influence with the General Assembly. And as a result of that, we were told, don't even bother bringing mandatory inclusionary zoning uh, to Raleigh uh, for resolution because we would not be getting it. So, and we believe that that, uh, that that finding, that assessment still applies today. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Any other questions on that? Uh, Ms. I'm, I'm on the line. Can I speak on that? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to clarify the previous, the previous question as far as the source of income and reentry ordinance. Um, I, I kind of heard a couple different things. Is that being moved to the full council or is it still in the committee or what is the next step for those ordinance, for those, um, for those actions? What, what, which, which actions? The have, ones have, have we had a, a discussion about it formally other than uh, it being a recommendation from the uh, the task force this summer, so it's it's, uh, it's scheduled to come before the Great Neighborhoods Committee. Okay, maybe we can talk offline because I know in the September meeting it was voted to come to the um, intergovernmental committee, and now I'm kind of it's kind of gray on on what the next steps are. So we can talk offline, Mr. Graham, if that's okay. If, if everyone else is clear on it. Um, I do want to speak on the, the inclusionary zoning. Um, so I understand the need to be strategic and collaborative in our approach and on our agenda. I also respect the wealth of political experience of Mr. Fenton and my colleagues in the process of how these items are approached. But what is our reality? 
We have a voluntary city ordinance, yet here we are with a 32,000 unit deficit of affordable housing. Our reality is that individuals who earn less than the area median income in our city are being priced out of Charlotte. Our reality is that due to gentrification, many residents and businesses are, all, are being priced out of Charlotte as well. Our reality is that 40% of the jobs lost due to COVID are not coming back. Our reality is that many who suffer with physical and mental illnesses are ending up homeless or in jail due to the lack of affordable housing. Our reality is that our working poor with families are in shelters or tents. Our reality is that we have a tent city in our uptown. We're just blocks away. There are millions, possibly billions of dollars worth of development that our residents don't have access to. Our reality is that there is a tale of two cities here in Charlotte. Our reality is that we as Char Charlotte City Council are sworn to serve all of our residents, not just some. And advocating for our most vulnerable residents and not advocating for our most vulnerable residents because it's not sexy or there's no current appetite at the state or federal level does not diminish our responsibility, in my opinion, to ask. Perhaps we have not, because we haven't, we've asked not. Uh, Mr. Fenton just said that, you know, there's a, there's a message not to ask, but yet there's no history of us actually coming to the table and, and asking for this legislation. Davidson has mandatory inclusionary zoning. Chapel Hill has mandatory inclusionary zoning. And I imagine that they have only a fraction of the need or the development. We keep saying that we cannot build our way out of this crisis, yet we know we don't have the supply to meet the demand. These are extraordinary times which call for extraordinary measures. We have to be deliberate, intentional, and committed to solving this crisis. I ask you, Mr. Chairman, and my colleagues to take a bold step and lead with a heart to serve and our most vulnerable populations, instead of a cautious mind not to affront due to political correctness. So, thank thank you, you, Councilwoman. Appreciate that. Um, we're not voting today. Obviously, we're just kind of hearing these things. So um, that's a that's good thoughts. Definitely encourage you to hang on to those and probably bring them back when um, with with either Councilman Graham, if that ends up being the route, or back here when we get back to um, to voting day. But um, yes, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, Dana, would you like to continue forth? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, on the next slide, um, if you get this, the, uh, the issue great... My apologies, I have my mic off. Uh, this starts the issues that the Great Neighborhoods Committee uh, had been considering and have been sent to council. and. Uh, before this, uh, we've asked uh, Ms. Weideman, the Director of Housing and Neighborhood Services, to come in to present, and she is here. If that is the, if the committee would like to hear these, Ms. Weideman's here. Thank you. Thank you, committee, and thank you, Mr. Fenton, for um, requesting that I be here to present. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, as was alluded to earlier, these came out of the housing task force that the mayor established this summer. Um, they have also been, um, this information has been shared with the Great Neighborhoods Committee. And so uh, Mr. Fenton requested that I share it with you all today. There are a couple of, um, couple of requests here. They are in three categories. Uh, the first one is the low income housing tax credit category, the eviction category, and the fair housing category. I would also add that Mr. Winston, Mr. Eggleston, Mr. Graham, and Ms. Johnson have heard these a number of times, so these will, this will not be um, new information for them. If you could go, um, actually, if so, um, go back, but go back to the first slide. That's a little bit out of order, but I can take it there. Um, in terms of the federal legislation, this one would be intended to um, in, to set a permanent minimum of the 4% housing tax rate. You all, um, each year, you approve both 9% tax credit um, 
proposals and you approve both 4% both, um, tax credit proposals. This one focuses on the 4%. It would fix that rate. That's important because developers um, would know exactly what amount of money that they are getting for the federal government. That's also important because to the extent that that is fixed, that will bring more money from the federal government, which means that you would further leverage your housing trust fund dollars here. Um, the other important thing here is that third bullet. Um, this would also establish a new state administered single family housing tax credit program. So those funds would come from the federal government to the state to administer a single family in the same way that a multifamily um, program is administered to date. If you would go to the next slide, please. This one is from a state perspective. Um, the request here is that um, it is that we would um, add a state tax credit pro program. Um, just as a reminder, the program you have now, the credits are handed down from a federal government perspective. This would be a program that state uh, and that would also allow you to further leverage your dollars. Just by way of example, South Carolina um, has a similar tax credit program and it's working really well there. <clears throat> So again, this would help you reduce, reduce and, and further leverage your dollars there. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. So this is in the category of, ev of evictions, and there was lots of discussion about this this summer as well. Basically, um, what this one would do is it would allow residents to have evictions removed from their records once the judgment is paid. So once, once they've paid any outstanding fines, it would allow that to be removed from their record. This would also help the landlords as well because they would have um, they would collect any past due amount. Often they don't collect any past due amounts there. And I'll let Mr. Fenton talk about um, previous experience with, with that program, if, if with this request. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. This one is um, also related to evictions. Um, it's about federal, it, it, it's a federal request. And basically, um, it's a federal re request, obviously, because credit reporting is, a, is governed by the federal government. But basically, what this one would do is it would provide relief for evictions that are associated with COVID. We know COVID has um, impacted our country, and primarily renters have been really hit hard. And so any, ev any evictions that are associated with COVID, um, this would advocate that that um, be removed from, from, or be removed from records going forward. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. From a fair housing, and so this gets back to the source of income discrimination. This is seen um, most wi widely when you talk about housing choice vouchers. So a couple of things, points of discussion here. Your developers who accept your your housing tax credit allocations, they also accept sources of income, so they don't discriminate. So this is, this is particularly targeted, targeted toward the private, um, the private market or the market rate landlords. And so the, the request here is um, simply to um, have, have a source of, of income discrimination. Um, I think what Mr. Winston and, and perhaps Mr. Graham have alluded to, there's also been some talk about let's discover, let's really be clear about what, if anything, we can do from a, from a local perspective um, as, as we talk about it, advancing this forward. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. Um, and then we've talked about um, re-entry. Re um, we've had a lot of discussion about, about re, the reentry, and I said to you, I believe it was at your meeting on the 5th, that HUD had released some guidance around what can be done about reentry. And so I brushed up a little bit of, uh, more on that. And basically what the 2016 guidance says is landlords should not deny housing based on an arrest alone. Um, as arrests without convictions do not justify the denial. Um, so that means that they simply shouldn't start with a, 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 a credit background, um, I'm sorry, a criminal background check and, and deny them housing based on having a, a, a criminal background. Um, convictions should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it also says that landlords need to look at 
Um, they should not use arrest records as a basis for excluding applications. Um, they should um, not, that an individual, um, they should look at prior convictions on to see what the prior conviction was. And so there are some things that are already prescribed in HUD's guidance. Um, during the course of this conversation and over the summer, um, we've been talking with um, Ken Schrader um, and, and some of some of the folks that work with him. What they've requested is that uh, we also work on this from a local ordinance uh, perspective as well. But again, these are presented to you today for your information um, as you consider to, to wrestle with what your um, legislative agenda will be. I'll stop there. Questions or comments? Okay, it's good work. Um, that, that's the last of the agenda items, right? For uh, it is, but we also have the assessment here. If you like, oh to hear yes, it. that please, of course. Okay, great. We talked about the mandatory inclusionary zoning before. Strongly opposed on both sides. Uh, the low-income housing tax credit uh, issues at the federal level. There's a mix of support and opposition to that. A lot of the opposition probably has to do with uh, uh, federal deficit concerns, uh, but. Uh, it, that's that's where it stands right now. On the, uh, as far as the low-income housing tax credit, the state, uh, there is a mix of support and opposition from the key influencers. The shelter industry is very supportive. You could have some uh, some pushback from the some of the think tanks at the state about this because it gets into tax credits. On the leadership side, tax credits were addressed in the in the tax reform effort of 2013. The House and the Senate dropped a lot of tax credits. It was a previously a tax credit at the state level for low-income housing. That expired on January 1 of 2015. And also, it, it could get into some budget issues with, we were talking about before, with the fluid nature of the state general fund budget. Uh, eviction relief, the post-judgment relief. Um, this is an issue uh, where the key influencers are supportive, the shelter industry. They worked with uh, some folks on the other side of the aisle to come up with some legislation. And in 2018, that was first unveiled. It didn't go anywhere. Then in 2019, it was put into House Bill 880. Uh, that relief language did pass the House, but it didn't go anywhere in the Senate. In fact, it was removed by a Senate committee, uh, and then that, that legislation did not move at all for the rest of the session. Uh, eviction relief credit reporting, uh, right now as we assess it at the federal level, the, the key influencers are being very cautious at the stage. We're only about six months, seven months into the pandemic. And so at, that, at this point, you know, the leadership probably really doesn't have a position on it either. Unfair housing at the state, uh, at the state source of income discrimination, uh, we find that, uh, that the key influencers uh, are, are strongly opposed. Uh, and uh, that the um, and that the leadership is the same way. Uh, at the federal level, we also f we find actually a little bit different a mix of support and opposition from the major groups who are influential. And actually, I made one mistake on the slide here where it says support reforming the voucher program. That should apply to the federal side. I apologize for that. The uh, in, in just a note of that is that some of the major organizations. Uh, have always have had issues over the years with the uh, housing choice voucher program and the way it's administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And, and one of the, some of the groups have, have, have tried to get reform efforts going in the Congress. And again, the leadership is probably the same way, a mix of support and opposition. And then finally, the reentry proposal, it's a state proposal. Uh, the industry, uh, the key influential industries are supportive of liability protection for landlords. Now, some of you who were uh, in, the, in the Housing Recovery Task Force may remember that one of the concerns of landlords is liability protection. They drafted language uh, in early 2019 to address that very issue, um, and that was put into House Bill 880. And that was another section that came out of the bill in the Senate, and then the bill itself never did move. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the 880 did not include, let me just clarify, did not include a, um, a provision where local governments could require lo uh, landlords to not ask about criminal history. It only, it only addressed the liability protection for landlords. 
Mr. Chairman, that, that concludes my remarks. Questions? Um, Councilman Graham, are you still there? Might have lost Councilman Graham. Mr. Graham. They, I, I, if there are no other questions, I, I'd just like to close out our section here by asking uh, one or two questions. One to you. Um, as a person who spent a lot of time um, in the General Assembly, um, what is, what is at, at just a high level, um, your view of of a successful legislative agenda from a city or a county to um, the General Assembly? One is, is who's sitting in the chairs, and so I think November 3rd um, uh, will be very important. Probably more important is November 4th, the day after the election, when we kind of see who's sitting in the chairs, who's in the, the governor's seat, uh, who controls the Senate as well as the House, will be a starting point um, because that way we can kind of gauge uh, where our friends are. Uh, secondly is having a, a strong relationship with our local delegation and that's something that has been absent. Um, any of these measures are going to have to be um, run by a member of our delegation and they have to believe in it as strongly as we do. Uh, and so really cultivating a relationship with the local delegation making sure that they understand the importance of the request, why we're requesting it, uh, and um, asking them to use their influence uh, to get it passed. Um, and their influence goes beyond the Mecklenburg County lines. They would have to work with other municipalities, with certainly urban communities, um, because even if it's a local bill, um, uh, the General Assembly will not open the door uh, for Mecklenburg County because when they do that, they open the door for Guilford, Wake, New Hanover, other, other of the larger counties across North and South Carolina. And so um, building a coalition across the state is going to be really important, making sure that our colleagues, the large urban counties, are in favor of any requests that's coming from Mecklenburg because we're going to need their support to get anything passed, uh, and having a, uh, a relationship with the, the key influencers. And I think um, Dana did a really good job uh, in terms of laying out the, the, the legislative request, uh, the key influencers and the leadership. I think that's really, really important because it's the key influencers and the leadership will determine whether or not these bills, first of all, even get heard. Um, we can, and I'll use this just as an example, um, um, the um, issue relating to mandatory inclusion. So we can put that on our agenda. Uh, um, a member of our delegation can introduce it, uh, but then the leadership can send it to, to the rules committee. Um, the rules committee never meets, <laughs> right? And so it's basically dead on arrival. Uh, and then, uh, and so I, I think those things are really important. Again, um, um, understanding where the key influencers are and where the leadership uh, is on these particular items. Both of those may change um, come November 3rd um, based on the election. Uh, and then uh, it's just the, the last is risk reward, right? I mean, I don't have, a, I don't have a, an objection to any of these things. Um, I would love to see mandatory inclusion zone. I would love to see the, the source of income discrimination passed. Uh, I think our, men, our mentality, though, has to be just not playing checkers, just making it move, but um, playing chess. How, how do we kind of get, get it through our local delegation? How do we get it, um, that local delegation, to work with um, delegations of similar size, i.e. urban counties, um, because it's going to impact them, too, on board, how do we influence key uh, influencers to, to get behind it and, and have those key influencers uh, influence the leadership. Um, and so uh, it may be a, an example would be gang legislation. Uh, you, you would think that would be uh, a nonpartisan item uh, that both Democrats as well as Republicans can agree, uh, can agree on. It took me four years to get it done. And, and most of the, those individuals who had the most questions about it uh, were members of my own party. I mean, so even if the deck 
changes on this on November 3rd, there's still some um, convincing that we would have to do, uh, even if the parties flip uh, and the D's were in control, that even we would have to begin to educate and inform even those with similar um, political leanings as we may have uh, to get some of these things done. And so it's, it's more of a, a chess game versus checkers just simply making a move. So I, I hope that answers your question. No, it does. That's very insightful. And I think the, the position we're in right now, kind of moving forward, where the main work of this committee each year is really kicking off of the hard work um, of, of, of figuring out how to play the, this properly, uh, kicks off. I think that's very insightful from that side. I just asked one more question of Councilman Mitchell. Uh, on our side, you know, you've you've seen you've been part of crafting and then delivering over a dozen of these. What what is, what is your kind of takeaways and best practices and just advice and guidance having done that as we embark on this next step, which is arguably the hardest. So thank you, Co-Chair. Just to, to share my uh, uh, my two cents. I think uh, Councilman Graham was just spot on, though. Um, just. November 3rd is going to be a big date for us. And, and I do think, and Councilman Winston mentioned this, we need to have a full-fledged strategy, i.e., write down our delegation point of contact, uh, write down what council member will also serve as the point of contact, and then just talk about how many times we would touch um, our delegation and ourselves. And then once the election comes, I think then it would be in our best interest to look at all these requests and really, I think, Co-Chair, you said it best last year, uh, ones that we think are, they need to be in the parking lot, one that need to be short-term, we can move forward with a strategy, and one is just long-term. So that would just be my two cents of us, identifying um, key, key stakeholders of our delegation and council, and then after November 3rd, really putting putting these issues in three different boxes. Yeah, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. And combining both of those points that you guys have, have made, Dana, perhaps perhaps we've discussed this in years past, but perhaps this is a great time given the volume and varying nature of low-hanging fruit to big ticket items that are in front of us here. You know, we not only come up with the takeaways we've decided today, but, you know, two scenarios by which um, we're, we're not waiting to respond on November 4th. Um, we have a November 4th plan based on what happens where we all divide and conquer and essentially start reaching out to people, um, saying things. So that way, you know, we're, we're, we're a step ahead of the race and, you know, 99 other counties that are probably going to be thinking very much along the same line. So perhaps that's something for us to noodle on. But um, good thoughts. Anybody else have anything they'd like to uh, mention or contribute? Okay, well, a productive session once again, and this marks uh, the scary point where we don't just get presentations anymore, but we have to figure out what to do. So um, I appreciate the committee's work. Dana, I'll let you close this out. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next slide, please. Um, your next meeting will be on Monday, October 19th at 2 p.m., the normal time. And at that time that the committee will be proposing state and federal legislative agendas and I just wanted to go over a few things here that, uh, that I think are important uh, for you to think about uh, uh, before that meeting. Uh, there are some core strategies. We talked a lot about strategies and things we need to do and what Mr. Mitchell brought up just now, uh, very, very helpful. And we think these are some helpful things to, things to think about too. And one of the things we've talked about a lot is about having policy goals that are as specific as possible. And, it, as, as specific as possible, I'm sorry. And, um, and also a good idea would be to rank the goals from top priority to lowest. That is basically looking at the likelihood of passage to least likely to be passed. And I think, we, we think we've done that here with the issues you've heard today. And we'd be glad to go back and do those with the issues that you heard last month. And of course, th this will help you uh, as you put together uh, a legislative agenda so that you're not uh, you don't have the distraction of some, some goals, perhaps, that are, are, are least likely to be passed. Also, uh, having po policy goals that could be achieved without state funding, but that could be enhanced in their success with state funding. That's when we brought up those two uh, issues about uh, the, on the digital divide and the crisis response team. Uh, you know, of course, available revenue next year might be severely or will be severely diminished. 
regardless of which party is in control. Um, and we'll find out more about that as we move ahead. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, also, uh, I think a very important thing I heard today, too, was collaboration, working with others. And, and it's important to have policy goals that apply, apply to both large and small cities and also baby counties as well and can be implemented by those smaller municipalities. So that's something else we need to think about. Uh, and also the ability to develop small coalitions to help uh, uh, support those policy goals are always important. And that includes not just local governments, other local governments, but also statewide business interests. And also uh, at the, on November 4th, regardless of who's in control, we need to be ready to work with that party. Uh, probably need to, uh, if it's, uh, the, if it's uh, the party other than the party that is in control here in Charlotte, you might need to focus on areas of agreement. And, uh, and also, and I know you all know this, uh, it's important to be respectful of, of their perspectives, legislators' perspectives, even though they may not reciprocate that. <laughs> uh, of course, the legislators at the state uh, have the power to, to do things here to the city that we would not, would not want to have done. And also uh, be respectful of their service as well. And also, uh, I know that legislators are very, very grateful when, when folks uh, say something, say good things about them through the media or even social media, regardless of the party. It really goes a long way. I know, Mr. Winston, you did that earlier this year, complimenting Representative Dean Arp of Union County for his work on the, on the, on the grow, growing rural economies with access to technology program. And I, I know that was, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, welcomed by Representative Arp. So, Mr. Chairman, that uh, concludes my remarks, and uh, this will be ready for next Monday. Indeed. Good meeting, everyone. Thank you. Uh, motion to, uh, is there a motion to get out of here? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Cool.